Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Joseph Glor, your host for today and the assistant content director here at Word on Fire. I'm excited to be with all of our listeners here today and excited to be here in sunny Santa Barbara with the truly prolific Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, how are you doing today? I'm good. Joe, how are you doing? Always good. good to be on with you. Good, good. Yeah, I say prolific because I actually just got a glimpse at some of the Pivotal Players episode. It's beautiful. If you haven't gotten your copy of the Pivotal Players DVD or any of the associated works, you can go to pivotalplayers.com and you can check that out. You can actually order it right now. And for our Word on Fire show listeners, we have a special $10 off coupon. And when you go to the checkout, all you have to do is enter TRACT90. That's T-R-A-C-T-9-0. And you'll understand uh, after the episode why we chose that coupon code. But if you go there in the next couple of weeks, you'll get that $10 off coupon. So make sure you stop by there right after you get done listening here. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit, Bishop, before we get started with our pivotal player of the day, which we're going to focus on for today's episode, on the West Coast premiere party for the pivotal players. Tell us a little bit about that. It was great. We had it just a couple of weeks ago at uh, Christ Cathedral in uh, Orange. So this is the former um, Crystal Cathedral that uh, Robert Schuller had, had created, but now it's the headquarters for the church in uh, Orange. And so we gathered there with about 300 people in their auditorium and... Uh, we showed uh, the Francis episode of the Pivotal Players. Then afterwards, I was interviewed along with uh, Father Steve, who's the CEO at Word on Fire, and Matt Leonard, the director of the series. We were interviewed by Doug Keck at EWTN. And uh, it was just a delight to talk to him. And we explored the series and the places we went and what motivated us. And so it was a very uplifting, uh, fun evening. Yeah, I was there. It was a lot of fun. I think a lot of people enjoyed it, and we had uh, shared on your Facebook as well a little video. Of, so if you if you weren't able to make it, you can check that out on Bishop Barron's Facebook page. See, I'd like to get on to, we got a lot to discuss today, so I'd like to move on to the pivotal player for today's episode, which is none other than the 19th century great Catholic convert, John Henry Newman. I know you have a special admiration for Newman as a fellow preacher and a theologian. I remember way back when I first started watching your YouTube videos, I remember hearing a million foreign philosophers, also some familiar names. But the three that kept seeming to pop out the most were, of course, Augustine, Aquinas, but the third was Newman. And I just kept hearing that name over and over again. Tell us a little bit about who this man was and perhaps uh, what he's meant to you. I'm glad you picked that up. Uh, He's one of my great heroes. Um, And I suppose that's true without really trying you know, to emphasize them, I just naturally do. Because I found that on issue after issue today, I'd go back to Newman. I'd say, Newman solved this thing, or Newman helps us with this thing better than anybody. So he became like Aquinas and Augustine for me, a sort of touchstone figure. Also the fact that Newman is a relatively contemporary figure, so dies in 1890, and also writes in our language. When I was teaching Newman at the seminary, I used to tell the students, you know, one of the great things about him is that we can read him in our own language. So most of the great figures from St. Paul, you know, on write in foreign languages. And so we're getting them, but we're getting them a second hand. And that's okay, but it's it's a special privilege when you can read a true master of the Christian thing who's also a master of the English language. And I would tell people who are interested in language that if, um, if you wanted just to savor that part of Newman, that was almost enough for a lifetime. But then we're getting this great theology in our own language. So that's why he became a very important figure for me. And I've just been reading him and studying him, teaching him, writing about him uh, for many years. A sketch, Newman is an Englishman born in London, 1801. Uh, his lifespan basically covers the 19th century. He's born 1801, dies 1890. Oh, wow. And then... Uh, His conversion takes place 1845, so exactly midway through his own life. Um, So it it sets up very neatly for uh, chronological analysis, Newman's life. Um, Newman comes of age in an Anglican uh, environment, goes to Oxford, and uh, Oxford for him was like Florence for Dante or for um, Michelangelo. Uh, It was his place. It was the place where he was shaped intellectually, culturally, every other way. He becomes a um, priest in the Anglican tradition, and he becomes a, a lecturer, a teacher, a writer. And that's what he, he wants to be. Along with um, several colleagues, and still a pretty young man, he becomes part of the Tractarian movement, so-called, the Oxford movement. These were Anglicans who wanted to give a more Catholicizing reading 
of Anglicanism. So they were leaning, if you want, in a more Catholic direction. Make a long involved story short, Newman writes many of these famous tracts um, laying out their position. A turning point was tract number 90, and you referenced it earlier on. Tract number 90 was Newman um, arguing that the 39 articles of the Anglican Church, which were the basic faith statements that had to be sworn to by anyone involved at higher levels of English uh, life, if you were a government official or a university teacher or a major a public figure, you had to swear to the articles. Well, Newman said that they could be given a very Catholicizing reading. Well, it sounds like a pretty uh, abstruse issue, but it caused a riot, literally, in England. And Newman was um, excoriated uh, in in every uh, uh, forum of public uh, exchange. And he became a, a, a sort of persona non grata in England. And it triggered, it didn't happen right away, but it triggered the process by which Newman began his uh, explicit move to Roman Catholicism. Um, Becomes a Catholic, as I said, 1845. He goes to Rome uh, and he sits with, um, you know, seminary students. He's one of the best theologians uh, in Europe, but yet he sits with Catholic seminarians and eventually becomes a Catholic priest and returns to England to um, um, propagate the Catholic point of view within the English context. Lots of ups and downs, including time as rector of the Catholic University of Ireland in Dublin. That met with um, a lot of conflict and difficulty. One of the marks of Newman's life was um, conflict, difficulty. He was a bit of a depressive personality, felt uh, a failure in most of his undertakings. Um, Toward the, um, uh, well, not quite end of his life, because he lives to be quite an old man, but in his 60s, he writes a masterpiece called the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which is Latin for an apology or it's an explanation of his own life. It's Newman's account, his autobiography, but the autobiography of his mind, if you want, how his mind moved from high church Anglicanism to Roman Catholicism, which sounds like a very small matter to us now, but was hugely important, both practically and theoretically, to Newman. Uh, That restored his reputation and the last decades of his life, he's a highly respected figure in England. And then as a um, quite an old man, he's made a cardinal of the Catholic Church by Pope Leo XIII. Who were, he, he was the first cardinal named by Leo, and he called him Il Mio Cardinale. He's, he's my cardinal. Because mm. Leo was one of these people that uh, really appreciated Newman. Uh, and then Newman dies in 1890, uh, full of years and, and with a very high reputation, I must say. And then I would say Newman emerges in the 20th century as one of the most important players. In fact, many argue, I'd agree with this, that he's the most important dead person at Vatican II. Namely, (laughs) so of all the great figures that came to Vatican II, Newman is the most important uh, um, theological spirit, if you want, of Vatican II. And you can see his influence in a lot of the council documents. Um, So anyway, great figure, fascinating figure both uh, as a convert uh, personally and theoretically. Yeah, an incredibly impressive biography there. Just a man who stuck to his convictions, you know, in kind of a Thomas Moresque type of way. Yeah. It just always stuck to his guns and followed truth down yes. to, the, to, to wherever it took him. And it cost him enormously. It's different today. You know, if someone today uh, become, you know, moves from high church Anglicanism to Catholicism, we would say, oh, good for you, and oh, congratulations, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> right. and, no one would, would uh, excoriate him or her, but in Newman's time, it meant he lost everything that he loved. He lost Oxford. You couldn't be an Oxford professor. You couldn't be an Oxford a preacher or lecturer if you were Catholic. And so Newman lost his position in English society. And this is someone now mid-career, uh, extremely successful, uh, had everything to lose, and he lost it. Because as you say, he followed what he took to be the truth, and he paid a very high price for it. Well, the name of his episode is John Henry Newman, The Convert, right? So we're going to keep focusing on his conversion as we go. But as you also mentioned, he was an amazing writer. You say in the episode that James Joyce said puts mm-hmm. him above uh, you know, almost anybody. So uh, we'll start with one of his major written works, which is his essays on the development of Christian doctrine. So uh, which he began actually writing as a Protestant, correct? So tell us about well, that. Uh, it's those very essays. interesting because the, the language there is, is instructive because Newman was an Anglican when he started, but Newman never saw himself as a Protestant because he saw the Protestants as 
the left wing extreme, if you want. Okay. He saw Catholics as the right wing extreme, and he was advocating what he called the via media, the middle way, what he thought was a commonsensical Anglicanism that had all the doctrinal uh, density of Catholicism, and um, and avoided the the excesses of Catholicism. It avoided the the uh, what he took at that time to be an excessive devotion to. Mary and the Saints, a preoccupation with the Pope, etc. So it was like a good, commonsensical middle ground, the Via Media. So Newman begins this work as an Anglican, but ends it as a Catholic. So as he's writing it, he undergoes this, this change. But let me stay with that first point, though, because I would read the essay on development of Christian doctrine as an anti-Protestant work. Now, why do I say that? Well, it was a commonplace among the Protestants, go back to Luther, Calvin, and companies, Vingley, and many others, that Catholicism represented this accretion of lots of extra-biblical um, elements. And they should be stripped away, and we should get back to the core, get back to the, the original biblical Christianity. Well, see, Newman's going to argue, these aren't extraneous accretions, but these things that the Protestants didn't like within Catholicism were legitimate developments of the seed that was present in the biblical revelation. So now all these great Newman metaphors come into play, like a river. Newman will say the river is actually not that interesting at its source. Think of the source of the Mississippi, you know, up in Minnesota is, you know, unimpressive as you can, you can jump over it. Yeah. But now look at the mouth of the Mississippi in New Orleans. It's this massive, mighty body of water that is, you know, deepened and broadened and been fed by all kinds of different streams and now subsists in its sort of beauty and depth and breadth, right? Or a tree, famously, a beginning of a little acorn. The acorn's not very impressive, but yet the tree, mighty in height and depth and breadth and all that. So in a similar way, he thought Catholicism represented the development of the seed that was present in the Bible. It was the unfolding of the river that began in the biblical revelation. And so a lot of what he does in that book is he defends things that Protestants didn't like and tried to show, look, if we're careful about this, we can see this is the steady unfolding of the biblical um, uh, source. Now, central to that book, and I, I love this, it's very relevant today, Newman distinguishes between legitimate development and corruption. So he admits there are corruptions. Sometimes the original biblical thing can grow in a distorted way, just as a tree can send off weird branches or mm. branches that die, and they have to be pruned, right? So there can be corruptions. He's not naive about that. Not like everything that happened is just great. There are legitimate developments, and there are corruptions. Now, third very important point. Therefore, what do you need? You need a living voice of authority that can make that determination. What's a legitimate development? What's a corruption? And that's where Newman began to see, and this is where a lot of his uh, conversion comes in. What's the only church that claims that there's a living voice of authority capable of making that kind of adjudication? It's the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, see? Because a Protestant might say, oh, it's the Bible. Right. But see, Newman said, but that can't work. That, it doesn't work because the question is, is that a legitimate development or corruption from the Bible? The Bible itself can't be the criterion for adjudication. The young Newman himself said, the church fathers, th that's how we decided. The church fathers said, okay, it's okay. Church fathers didn't like it, it's no good. But then he realized the church fathers, as much as he reverenced them, they're all dead. In other words, they're not a living voice of authority. The Roman Catholic Church alone claimed to be such a voice that the bishops and pope acting in unison could pronounce and say, yes, that's legitimate. For new ideas and yeah. for new things and yeah. new circumstances. Yeah. And so Newman doesn't use this, but it's my application of it. It's like a referee, right, in a game. So a game is a good analogy, too, because think of a game of basketball that's unfolding and as I often said, no group of five players has ever brought the ball to the court in the same way, right? Basketball is always new in some ways. It's fresh. Every play is, is new. It's a new approach. The defense is arranged in a, in a novel way, different players, etc. 
Okay, so good, novelty, creativity, terrific. But there's a guy who's wearing a black and white shirt. That's important, isn't it? The referee is black, white. Because he's got to decide, often right on the spot, no, what just happened there might have been entertaining, it might have been effective, but it's not basketball. See, so that's what a foul is, right? Sure. A foul is, yeah, you can do that. You, you can hit the guy's arm when he's shooting, but that's not basketball anymore. Or you can step out of bounds and to get around your defender. Yeah, I know, man, you can do it, but it's not basketball anymore if you do that. And so the referee is a living voice on the spot to say, no. Yeah. Uh, that's the role of authority in the church. And Newman saw that as subsisting in the Catholic church in a way it subsisted in no other church. Now, what was the, uh, what was the actual spark that started Newman's conversion? Well, th- there are a lot of things, and this would be in line with Newman's own reflections. There wouldn't be one thing, but, but I'll, I'll highlight uh, one I think was especially important. So after the Track 90 controversy, but before, a few years before he eventually becomes a Catholic, Newman settles in for two summers of serious research. And Europeans to this day uh, will do that. If they're academics, they'll teach during the year. But in the summertime, you go to a cabin or something. You go away and, and you just, you're just going to read for about three months. You, you would know? love that. Yeah. Well, I think it's, <laughs> a, it's, a great, it's a great rhythm. You know. Anyway, yeah. Newman starts reading his favorite area, which is the Church Fathers. And I'll, I'll just do a quick little version of this. What he finds, especially in the famous uh, Arian controversies after the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, was you had three positions emerging. You had, if you want an extreme left-wing position, um, and then you had an extreme right-wing position, which was the, the Orthodox, the, if you want the Catholic position, and then you had a middle position. Now, the extreme left would be Arianism. Extreme right would be Orthodox Catholicism. The middle position was what's called the homoousian position. So Nicaea said that Jesus is homoousios with the Father, meaning of one substance, one in being, consubstantial, right? Well, the Arians said, no, Jesus is not God at all. Catholics said, yes, he is. Then there was a middle ground, a middle position that said, you know what, you're both kind of right, because I would say he's homoousios. He's of like substance to the Father. Homo versus homoi is one iota. Iota is the little Greek letter, which is why that phrase came in. It's, you're battling over one iota. Yeah, it's That's where little... it comes from is homoousios versus homoiousios. Okay. Uh, Newman said, hmm, there was a left-wing position, there was a right-wing position, and there was a, there was a via media. Right, which is he's been advocating for. Right. So he's saying, if I do an analogy here, I've been defending the via media all these years. Yeah. But actually, classically, the left-wing and the middle way were both wrong, but the orthodox was right, and that's actually still what the Roman Catholic Church holds. Anyway. He had a couple experiences like that, looking at uh, analogies from the ancient world. It began to shake his confidence in the via media. He began to suspect, you know, I know it's superficially attractive. Like, oh, and we all do that. You sure. Know, this extreme and there's that extreme and I'm right here in the middle. It's like America right now. Both people love that. Yeah. Right. But Newman said sometimes the middle is, is not the right position. The middle ground is equally wrong. You know, anyway, that was a trigger for a lot of further meditation. And so is there a specific moment or, you know, like a Saul moment where there was no, a coming to the No, Lord and that's what? important. No, and that's very much in line with Newman's instincts. Uh, his conversion was a slow, meditative, very intellectually oriented conversion. It happened over time and through a lot of different influences that finally cohered in such a way that it pushed him to say yes now. But it's not like a Pauline thing where we're struck by lightning. It was a much more gradual. Um, a bit like Edith Stein in the 20th century, the way she's converted. Now, we've talked a lot about his conversion. One thing I'd like to go into is some of, rather than his conversion to the Catholic Church from Anglicanism, trying to convert and evangelize the secular culture at large. Let's talk about how he began with the university system and having that be something that will bring people into the faith. He wrote uh, a book called The Idea of the University. Yeah, and it it grows out of uh, lectures he gave when he was named rector of this Catholic university in in Dublin uh, in the 1850s. And I'll just say one quick thing about these wonderfully dense and beautifully crafted um, essays. Newman felt that 
there was a danger in his time, and boy, has it, has it been true in our time, that uh, religion is emptied of its intellectual content, that religion is seen simply as a subjective state of affairs. It's the externalization of one's private you know, um, feelings. Think here at the high level of someone like Friedrich Schleiermacher that says religion is the feeling of absolute dependency. So a kind of sentimentalizing of religion. Newman wanted to recover the intellectual density of religion. What was worrying him was, in his own time, and boy, in our time, but the expulsion of religion or theology from the circle of university disciplines. So here's all the serious intellectual disciplines. And there were universities at the time that were being formed without religion in that circle. And the essays really center around this theme of what happens when religion is kicked out of that circle. And all kinds of distortions uh, set in to university life, intellectual life. And I would say they are massively borne out today. Uh, something I felt very strongly about my entire career as a writer and speaker is the same thing. That we have a tendency to empty religion of its intellectual content. Uh, it's simply a matter of subjective feeling. It's an externalization of my uh, convictions. I can't really argue about it rationally. And Newman fought, fought, fought against that. And I think that's hugely important for evangelization today. Another one of his deeply intellectual works about religion and about doctrine was his grammar of ascent. And so tell us a little bit about that. And this is a highly philosophical text. And, and yeah. how does that help evangelize the culture as well? Well, I'd say if you're starting with Newman, don't start with that text. This is most complicated. Um, the great Bernard Lonergan, you know, who's one of the densest writers in the 20th century, said that he read the Grammar of Ascent 19 times before he started his own work, which is called Insight, which is one of the most difficult and important works in 20th century religious epistemology. But he read Newman first, like mad, before he did his own. So don't start with that. It's the most complicated. But man, is it an important book. Um, again, we go on for a, for a semester about just that. But I'll say one simple thing. Newman felt that inference and assent should not be um, collapsed one into the other. Now, he was arguing here against a typically modern form of rationalism that would say the assent you give to a proposition should be directly proportionate to the quality of the inference that you can muster for the statement. It's a fancy way of saying, if you got a clinching argument for something, all right, assent all the way, you know? Two plus two equals four. Yep, I totally assent to that. You got a middling argument, your assent should be kind of middling, you know? You got a lousy argument, you should give very little assent. John Locke argued this, for example. Newman, with tremendous um, psychological and epistemological perception, said, but you know, it just ain't the case that in fact, maybe if angels operate that way, but, but we, in fact, often give total assent to things for which we don't have absolutely clinching rational arguments. Like, for example, I'll assent to the claim that this lady who lives in, uh, in outside Chicago is my mother. Now, can I prove it? Do I have a clinching rational argument? Can I construct a syllogism, airtight syllogism that that lady's my mother? Well, of course not. But yet, I don't hesitate for a minute. I don't say, well, well yeah, I guess I kind of believe Yeah, I don't mother. remember the day I was born. Yeah, so. right, right. And so his point there was, assent is not simply reducible to the quality of inference, but rather lots of non-rational, quasi-rational uh, elements go into the, into the act of assent. Hunch, instinct, feeling, experience, witness, character, uh, other people that hold the opinion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these different things come together. And by means of what Newman called the illative sense, it's an interior sensibility, a bit like conscience in the moral order. The illative sense allows you to read these things together in such a way that the mind is led to assent. Now, I know that all sounds desperately abstract, and it is, but it has a very important implication. How do you bring someone to say, yeah, I agree with that. I believe that. Let's say the Christian faith. It's a matter of argument. Well, Newman and I, I'll, I'll join him here. We're big on argument. We like argument. Don't, don't void religion of his intellectual content. All right, that's true. However, it's rarely reducible to that. 
many other elements come into play to move the mind to assent. And I think for the evangelist, for the apologist, that's like uber important to keep in mind. Especially today. Yeah. When it, people are focused on scientific fact for things. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't believe it. Right. But there are a lot of things come into play that affect belief. And I think the apologist or evangelist has got to be uh, nimble enough to use these different elements. Um, I think of you know uh, Paul, Paul Claudel, the great French playwright, who was converted to Catholicism. By the rose window at Notre Dame. (laughs) And that's not an exaggeration that he says it. One day, looking at that rose window, he's converted. You say, well, that's a dumb reason to be converted. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Paul Claudel was no dummy. (laughs) But uh, I would say it's probably part of Newman's thing. It was one of the elements maybe that drew together a lot of instincts, feelings, ideas, intuitions, but finally brought it to a head. So I think that's really important for evangelists. And and if you have the patience and the smarts to sit down and and plow through the grammar of ascent, it really, it'll it'll repay the effort. Well, I think we've answered our last question with a lot of the responses you've given. What makes John Henry Newman a pivotal player in in world history and the history of the church? I mean, in a word, what would you say? Well, you know, I'd say in a word that he's one of the most important people to engage modernity. One of the first ones to say, I'll take the challenge of modernity, and in fact, I'm going to raise you. Like, you know, he'll, he took on the challenge of the Enlightenment and turned it back on, on Locke and Hume and, and company. And so he sets the tone for a lot of the present conversation still with the advocates of modernity who are calling religion into question. Newman is still a hugely important resource for those of us involved in that conversation. Well, that sound takes us to today's listener question. If you have a question for Bishop Barron, simply go to askbishopbarron.com and you can easily record your question from any device and maybe we'll hear you on the show next week. Today's question comes from Jean, who is hoping to convert her Protestant uncle and wants to understand the Protestant difference of sola scriptura. Let's listen to Jean. Hi, this is Jean from Ohio. Um, My uncle recently left another Protestant church because he didn't agree with their doctrine and their teachings of the Bible. So my mother and I would like for him to explore the Catholic faith, but one of his hang-ups is that Catholics do not believe in sola scriptura. Can you please explain the Catholic stance on sola scriptura? Yeah, good. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, my basic argument about Sola Scriptura is it's not in the Bible. There's a kind of anomaly that the principle that the Bible alone is the source of, uh, of you know, Christian teaching and life and doctrine is itself not biblical. And that's what Sola Scriptura means, right? Yeah, it means by, by the Scripture alone. So New, uh, Luther had the famous uh, solas, you know, by grace alone, by faith alone, by Scripture alone. Um, but Sola Scriptura by Scripture alone is not a scriptural principle. Um, so I think you're involved in a kind of um, uh, tension right at the beginning. What's the Catholic view? The Catholic view is that the Scripture is the soul of theology. The Scripture is the, the source. It's the animating uh, soul of theology. But Scripture has got to be interpreted. Scripture is in dialogue with um, the culture in which the church finds itself. Uh, new questions emerge, uh, new perspectives, new challenges And so the history of theology is not the history of the distortion of the Bible, but rather of the gradual unfolding and interpretation of the Bible. So Newman's helpful there. You know, Um, the tendency of Luther and company was to say, you got the Bible, which is great, the Word of God, and then everything else is kind of a distortion or it's an accretion. And we would say, no, it's the Bible unfolding under the influence of the Holy Spirit through great theologians and, and uh, scriptural interpreters and saints and so on. So the Catholic tradition is both and. Um, where the Lutheran and, and Protestant tradition tends to be dialectical, tends to be either or. So scripture alone and not uh, tradition and so on. We would say no, both and. Both scripture and tradition. Um, and But I, I, my basic challenge is, is find sola scriptura anywhere in the Bible and I'll give you 10 bucks. 
Well, thanks so much for tuning into the Word on Fire show. I want to mention again the coupon code, TRACKED90. You can type that into PivotalPlayers.com at the checkout for $10 off when you purchase the Pivotal Players DVD or Blu-ray. Now, this offer will only last two weeks, so go to the website right now so you don't forget. And again, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you back here next week at the same time, same station, same Bishop Robert Barron, right here on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.